Hello, I'm Brenda Antrim, one of the librarians here at Santa Monica College. This will be a workshop on finding and evaluating resources for your research. When you start to do research, it always works better if you have a plan. If you follow the research process, you'll get where you need to go more easily. The first thing you do is choose your topic, figure out what you need to write or speak about. Then you do some preliminary planning and looking for information to support that topic. Make sure to keep your topic broad when you start out um, and then narrow it down as you go. Sometimes if you start with too narrow a topic, you cut off avenues of exploration that could make your essay or your speech much more interesting. And sometimes you narrow yourself right out of any resources. So if you're unsure, talk to your instructor. Once you've figured out what you need to look for, you start looking for your resources actually doing your research. This might be um, the things that your instructor requires you to get, like you must have five scholarly journal articles, or it must be things that you just need to um, read in order to understand your topic better. You may find yourself um, gathering resources in your research that don't end up making it into your work site or your list of resources, because the reason why you're doing research is primarily to understand your topic. Once you understand your topic, then you can write or speak intelligently on it. Once you've located resources, your next step is to evaluate your resources. And there are two types of evaluation. One is a sort of on-the-spot evaluation of the resource itself. And we'll talk in more depth about that later in this presentation. But it's things like, who has written this? Um, are they an authority? Are they an expert? What do other people say about them? Um, is this a good piece of information in itself? The second type of evaluation is after you've gathered all of your resources, and then you start saying, okay, are the resources that I've gathered, which are in themselves good pieces of information, applicable to my research? Or are they supplementary? And if they're applicable to your research, you keep them. And if they're supplementary, you may or may not include them. Then you get down to the work of writing your paper and citing your sources. You must cite your sources because if you use someone else's work and you don't give them credit, that's plagiarism, which is a form of theft and can get you into a great deal of trouble. And it can be difficult sometimes to determine what is plagiarism and what isn't. So talk to your instructor if you're unsure. And finally, proofread. After you've written and you've revised, take a final look at it and see what you've missed. Because sometimes when you look at something many, many times, your eye skims over where you missed a sentence or you forgot to put in um, a part of a quote or something like that. So today we're going to really look at number three and number four in this research process. When you start looking, I highly recommend that you start in the library. And the reason for that is because we have curated and archived resources that are applicable specifically for scholarly research. We also have a lot of other things as well, so um, when you use the tools, you'll want to be careful in how you use them, and we'll talk about that. The first place you want to start is OneSearch, which is the search field that you see when you go to the library homepage, and it looks a little like a Google, work, uh, Google search box, but it's not like Google because it only searches the things we own or can access. It can be a little overwhelming depending on the topic you're searching and bring back loads and loads of information, so you'll want to limit it. And I'll talk about that more as we go deeper into this presentation. The second place you go looking is specific databases. And databases can be general in that they have a little bit of everything on a little bit of every topic. They might be format specific in that they're only newspapers or only journal articles, although those are broadening out to have some other things like book chapters in them. Or it might be topic specific where it's only on business or it's only on art or it's only on a specific science. So the databases take a little bit longer for you to search, and they assume you know more about your topic. So I'm going to talk about that more when I get to the books. The final place you look is the web for those things that you can't find in the databases um, or in the books. And when you get into the web, then you look a little deeper in your evaluation, because that first level of evaluation has not yet been done. So you have to determine who wrote it, what they're actually saying when you take away the spin, and why they took the time and effort and money to put this on the web. What do they want from you? We have a video on the Santa Monica College Library YouTube channel, specifically on website evaluation, that I also recommend if you would like to learn more about this topic. That um, YouTube channel is linked from the homepage of the library. 
So here is a quick introduction to the primary buttons on the library website. First you'll notice the one search bar and we'll do a search in that in just a little bit more. My library count is exactly that. If you want to find out is my book overdue you can do that. Databases are a listing of all of the databases that we subscribe to. We have over 120 of them at this point. Research guides are kind of like research pathfinders and they could be anything from how do I find out about this information um, in the subject of economics to how do I cite using APA. Workshops and videos are a listing of our current live and live via Zoom workshops as well as our archived workshops and a link to our videos on the SMC Library YouTube channel. Ask a Librarian is 24-7 chat reference. You can get help at any time from a college or university librarian. If you contact us during the time when Santa Monica College Library is open, you'll talk to one of our librarians, unless we are teaching, in which case we are doing that instead of being on chat. If you contact us when we're not open, say it's 2 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon and you're having difficulty with this database, you can still ask a librarian and they will be able to assist you. We belong to an international consortium of librarians and they are all college and university librarians, so they're all very handy at dealing with research questions. If your question is local and they can't answer it, they will leave what's called a ticket for us and as soon as we are open again, we will contact you via email and make sure that your question is answered. The final thing in the quick button is the book a study room. We have about 18 study rooms for about 25,000 students. So you might want to book in advance if it's midterms or finals and you know you're going to need a room for your study group to meet in. You don't have to be a group to meet in a study room. Individuals can also check out study rooms. There are QR codes that are posted in the windows of the study room. So you can basically be at the room and check it out. Um, so if, for example, you have an online class and you want to be able to talk and you listen and participate in this class, you can't really do that out in the library as a whole because it's loud and it disturbs other people who are trying to study. But you can go into a book, um, into a study room and do it in there. So this allows you to do your online classes from the library in a space where you're not disturbing everybody else trying to study. So heading into the research process, when you go looking for information, the first place you want to start is books. And you start there not just because I love books. You start there because books are unique in that they assume you don't know anything about your topic. You may know things about your topic, but you may have holes in your information that you're unaware of. So if you don't know what you don't know, how do you know you don't know it? Well, by reading books about it and finding out more about the topic. So um, the book is also the place where you find search terms. So. The way you describe a topic may not necessarily be the way that people doing research in that field describe the topic. And because you're not a researcher in that field yet, you're just starting out perhaps, you don't know those terms. But the books will tell you that. And they will also give you background and context on that information. So when you go into the databases and you look for those scholarly journal articles that assume you know about the topic, you do have that information so you're not lost. Most of these books um, are available in the stacks. All of the print books are available in the stacks unless they're textbooks. And the way you discover where they're at is by their call number. Main just means they're at the library in the, on the main campus. Stacks is a library word that just means bookshelf, which means you just go to the open shelf, pull the book, take it to the main desk by the front door and check it out for two weeks. And the call number is like an address for the book. If you have used the public library but haven't been in an academic library before, this can be a little confusing. This is not the Dewey Decimal System. This is the Library of Congress um, classification system. But it breaks down this alphanumeric code has meaning. And if you think of it like an address for a house, um, this would be the street the house is on. This would be the house itself. This is the shelf the book is on. This is the specific book. This is the topic that the book is about. And this is the specific work on that topic. So RBs, nursing. S916, Subasic, published in 2023. How this helps you is say somebody has picked up this book and looked at it and then they left it on a table somewhere and it hasn't made its way back to the shelf yet. What do you do? There's there's this empty space on the shelf where there should be a book. Well, anything at RB155 will be on the same topic. So if you find any other books in that area, you may be able to use those instead. 
while this book makes its way back home to the shelf. The second kind of book that we have in print are textbooks. Textbooks are brought to us by your instructor and they are loaned to us to loan to you. Because of that, they cannot leave the library. You check them out at the front desk. First you look up the call number and if it says reserves, you know it can't leave the library. So you write this call number down and you take it to that front circulation desk by the front door and you say, I need a reserve book and here's its number. And they check it out to you for two hours and then you can photocopy it, read it, make notes, etc., and give it back. So that's one way that you can use textbooks at the library. And if we don't have your instructor's textbook, ask your instructor to bring it over for us to put it on reserve for you. They listen to their students more than they listen to their librarians when we ask. We also have a book uh, section called the Textbook Commons. For those classes that have many, many sections, um, things like, for example, a foreign language, possibly a math book or a business book, we have found funding to buy some copies of those books. And we've placed them next to the photocopy room behind the reference desk. So when you come in the library and you head toward the middle of that main floor, you'll see a reference desk where librarians sit and you can ask them questions on your research. And then directly behind them to your left and their right is a series of bookshelves that have these textbooks on them. Now because they're textbooks and you need to use them and so do the 35 other people in your class, they also cannot be checked out and taken home. But you can pick them up right off the shelf, make your copies, take your notes, and then just put them back on the shelf or give them back to the librarian. So this way you don't have to find their call number and ask for it at the desk. The copies are there. We have multiple copies of some of these books, so you can just pick them up, do your homework, put them back. Okay. The final kind of book that we have are ebooks. Ebooks are available um, in collections, um, both uh, collections just of ebooks and also databases that include ebooks. If you are on your own device or off campus, you'll have to log in with your Canvas logon so that it knows you're an SMC student, otherwise, it wouldn't be able to um, check them out to you. Now, one thing to know about ebooks is there are many, many different interfaces for these ebooks, so they look differently because the different publishers set that. The library doesn't have control over it. And this also extends to what you can do with this book after you open it up. Sometimes you can download the whole book. Sometimes you can download just a chapter at a time. Sometimes you can only download a certain limited number of pages. This again is regulated by the publisher and the library has no control over it. So what I recommend when you're using a book for research, you don't necessarily have to read the entire book. You go through the book to find out stuff about the topic you didn't know. And then you use that stuff in your essay or your speech. It's the same way when you're using an ebook. You skim through it to find those pieces of information that you want to add to your paper or your speech. You download those pages or email those pages and that way you don't run out of pages under the limit that the publisher sets before you have all of the information that you need. <clears throat> So we're going to do a book search and we're going to use artificial intelligence and journalism as our example. So heading over here into the Santa Monica College Library or Santa Monica College website, the way you get to the library is to mouse over student support and click on library or click on student support and scroll down a little bit to more helpful services and resources, middle of the page, middle of the listing alphabetically. Click on the library and it will take, it, take you to our page. You'll see on the library all of the buttons that I talked about earlier, along with some other things, including our upcoming events, links to resources, including our YouTube channel, Ask a Librarian. Also, this is for faculty. Please don't request an orientation as an individual. It's for classes. <laughs> that happens sometimes. And then our contact and hours information when we're closed over the specific semester. So we're going to do a one search on artificial intelligence and journalism. You can tell I've been doing a little research on this already. And when I hit enter, it brings me up about 1400 or so results. Now these are everything we own or have access to, which is articles, books, and more. But you can tell this database where to look in what specific collection. So again, it's Sunday, two o'clock in the afternoon. You can't necessarily get a book off the shelf because we're closed until the next day. So you can ask it only for those that have online access. Or say you're looking specifically for a textbook. You can ask it just for textbooks. Or 
Say you need um, a print edition of something. Your instructor said you have to check out a book. It has to be a print book. You can ask for books that are here on the library shelf. So that is one way that you could limit your search is by collection. Another way that you can limit your search is over here on your left-hand side by a number of various refinements that you can add. So the first thing that I'm going to say is um, I'm not particularly caring whether it's online or it's at the library because I'm here at the library and it's open. But I do know I'm looking for books. So I can click on Format and it will tell me all of these various formats that things come in. The difference between books and book chapters um, are the books are the entire book and the book chapters are extracted from books. So it's not the entire book. So I'm going to ask for the full books. I'm going to apply those filters and that takes me down from 1450 to 81. Now other things that I could do is I could ask for a specific subject. Notice how many different ways it can split the subject up. I might ask for a specific language, a specific publication date, even a specific location. Okay. But I am uh, available and able to use either online or, uh, or uh, print books. So I'm going to look through and I'm going to find something that looks interesting. Um, a lot of this is on marketing or it's on AI specifically, um, but maybe this might be something that would be interesting for me. When I click on it, it opens up information about the book. It tells you how many chapters are in the book. And it gives you more of those subjects that you can use to make your search more specific when you go into other searches and databases. Finally, um, it gives you possibly a description or um, an abstract of the book. So say I read through this description and this really doesn't actually look like what I'm looking for. I can close it, I can go back, and I can look for another book. Maybe one that's more specifically on journalism. And when I click on that, it opens up the same type of information and I notice the subjects are very different and maybe these subjects are closer to what I'm looking for. So I go up to where it says view online and I click on the database where it's held and that will open up a new window where the book is listed for me. Keep in mind that these interfaces will be different. Now you can download the entire book here. You can also download individual chapters. Not all interfaces allow you to download the whole thing. Download the whole thing. Some will actually open the book up, and then you'll see which pages you want to download. So it all depends on the publisher. Okay. Then I'll read the abstract, and if I decide that I like this, I can use it for my research. And then I can go back to my search and find more. So that is how you use OneSearch to find books specifically. So the next thing we're going to look at is you've read your books, you've got your topic in mind, you've got some search terms in mind, you've filled out your foundational knowledge, and you feel ready to go into step two. And step two is periodicals. Periodicals are anything that is published regularly. Um, so with a book, you publish it once, you publish it again a few years later. If the content is the same, it's just a reprint. Um, if the content has changed, it's a new edition, but it's not the same book. With a periodical, You've got the LA Times published 10 years ago, five years ago, three weeks ago, today, it's still the LA Times. You've got Time Magazine, it was published five years ago, last month, this month, it's still Time Magazine. So with periodicals, the content changing doesn't change what it is because it's set up to be that way. And there are a couple of different types generally of periodicals, popular ones and academic ones. Popular periodicals are newspapers and magazines, generally. They're written by journalists who are not necessarily experts in those fields. They are intended to cover any topic that would be of interest or would sell. And they are targeted for general readers, for absolutely everyone. So they use regular language, um, relatively short stories um, that do a lot of explaining about things. 
Scholarly journal articles, on the other hand, um, are written by researchers in the field for researchers in the field. So they assume that you have background knowledge about the topic they're writing about, and they will talk about what's new in that field, but they won't explain what's already there. They think you already know it, or you wouldn't be reading scholarly journal. They use college level or above writing and discipline specific language. So there might even be terms that they use that you've never heard of. Scholarly journals can sometimes feel like you're reading a different language because you kind of are. You're using a discipline language. Um, so that can be a little confusing. And um, don't feel intimidated by this because I have had seminars at graduate level on how to read scholarly journal articles. This is something that you're learning constantly the whole time you're in college. Um, so <laughs> accept and enjoy. <laughs> this is going to be the rest of your academic life. Um, the other thing about journals that you need to know that is different than popular periodicals is that they are peer-reviewed. A magazine article might go through an editor, might go through a fact checker if you're lucky. Um, a scholarly journal article, if it is in a peer-reviewed journal, which it should be, will go out to other researchers and experts in the field so that they can fact check so they can check conclusions to make sure that nothing is missing, to make sure that this journal article actually adds something to the discipline and isn't just repeating something that's already been done. Um, and that is very important for scholarly research, is to make sure that that double checking has been done before it is published. Sometimes stuff still slips through, and that's very embarrassing for everyone. But for the most part, peer review ensures that the information that you get is relevant, it is uh, developing that discipline, and it is useful for your research. There is one sort of um, strange category in the middle that I want to mention because it can confuse people, and they're called trade journals. And they're called journals, but they're not academic. The reason why they're called that is because, like journals, they're written for people in a specific group, but that specific group is an industry. It's not an academic discipline. So it might be um, for fashion designers, or it might be for computer scientists, or it might be for people in the automotive industry. So just like with scholarly journals, it assumes that you are a bit of an expert in whatever this is. So it won't do a lot of explaining. It'll just say, hey, here's the big new thing that just came off of the assembly line. Or here's the big new thing that just came out of Milan for fashion. Um, so it's very focused on one topic, just like a scholarly journal. But for the most part, they are written um, by people who may or may not have credentials in that area, but they are not necessarily, in fact, they will not be, um, usually researchers in that area. <coughs> Excuse me, I had a cough. Um, so this can be a little confusing because they are not scholarly, but they call themselves journals. So if you're unsure, ask your instructor because quite often in your research, they will require you to use scholarly your journals. And if you use popular periodicals or trade journals, that doesn't count toward your um, requirement for journal articles. Okay. So just like we did a general search for a book, you can also do a general search for an article in OneSearch. This time you would tell it, instead of format book, format articles. And then again, you can also add subject. You can um, say, I want peer review journals. You can add a date limiter. And then you click on it just like we did with a book and it will take you to the database that holds that article. There are some additional notes for refining searches for journal articles specifically. You want to make sure that they are peer reviewed. You want to limit by date and you want to ensure that you click full text. Many of the databases don't have permission to have the entire article. They only have permission to list information about that article and you want the whole article. And if you click full text, you should get the full article. The other thing is a search hint. When you're searching, it's really difficult to evaluate each article as you come to it because you're looking at it sort of in its own little bubble. The best way to evaluate articles for your research is to evaluate lots of articles at once to see what you can find across them. But if you're evaluating that individual article, um, to start off with, don't read the whole article. Just read the abstract, which is the author supplied summary of that article. 
It is different than an annotation. An annotation is something a, a writer, like the researcher, writes that says why that article it was really good for their research. But an abstract is written by the person who wrote the article, and it's saying this is the important information about my article. This is the research study I did. This is what we discovered, that sort of thing. Um, and what you want to do when you're searching, because your brain works differently when it's reading and writing versus when it's searching and evaluating, is find an article. Does the abstract look like this article could be useful for your topic? Mail it to yourself. Go to the next one. Abstract look useful? Mail it. Go to the next one. Abstract doesn't look like it would be useful? Skip it. Go to the next one. And keep going until you have at least twice as many articles as you are required to have. So if your instructor says you have to have five articles, find ten. And the reason for this is research when done right leads to discovery. So you learn new things as you're researching. And if you only get the bare minimum, you might find something really interesting when you're reviewing it for your writing and think, oh, I want to find out more about that. Oh, I only have five articles. I have to stop my writing and go back and do some more searching. And if you have ten to begin with, the first one may be great, the second one may not be so good, number eight may have been fantastic, and you never would have found number eight if you'd stopped at number five. So while you're in that search retrieve mode, gather at least twice as many articles as you think you're actually going to you know, be required, and then stop, take a break, start reading the articles individually and looking for threads and themes and information. And that will tell you very quickly which articles you can use and which ones maybe not so much. Now for your date, this depends on the topic you're searching. If you're searching a topic that is changing quickly, law, medicine, um, technology, you might want to go back only two to five years. If you're searching something that there's a long-standing history on it and seminal or important works maybe were only done once 12 or 15 years ago, maybe you're doing a philosophy paper or you're doing a history paper and you need some primary documents, documents that came out at the time of whatever event it is that you're researching happened, you might go back 10 years. So ask your instructor how far they want you to go back when you do your journal searching. Start broadly and then narrow it down because if you start with a topic that's incredibly narrow and focused, you might cut out some good stuff, you might miss some things, we might not even have anything on that topic because it's really, really specific. So for example, I might do a scholarly journal search on artificial intelligence, which is a huge topic, and ethics, which is a huge topic, and the overlap between those two topics, that's where my subject lies. When you're looking for news, it's a little bit different. One note on news is that people say all the time, oh, the news is lying to me. Maybe, maybe not. That's what evaluation is for. But one thing that people call lies that is just the nature of the beast is something that you should be aware of, and it's called the news cycle. News is reported as things happen, and things change over time. So to use a terrible example, if there is an earthquake, we had one this morning, and um, five people are injured, when the news reports it, it will report a magnitude, a placement of the quake, and the injuries that happened because of it. Now a couple of days go by, and sadly two of those people pass away. Also, the geologists have determined that the magnitude was a little bit smaller or bigger than it was originally reported, and maybe it, the epicenter was a little bit further south. So that news report is updated, and it tells you about the poor people who passed away, and it updates the information about the earthquake. That first news report that was put out when it happened is now factually inaccurate, but it's not a lie. It was what they knew at the time it was published. And as they know more and they refine their information, they update those news reports. This is why it's important when you're looking for news and you're looking for facts to get the most current information even if it's something that happened five or six years ago. Now, when you're doing your research, you also might be looking for something called primary documents. News reports are excellent primary documents. So if I wanted to get um, information about, say, the Northridge quake, which happened several years ago and was a terrible tragedy, I could get newspaper reports from the time that it happened, 
And then I could get news reports done maybe 10 years later that are retrospective, talking about the rebuilding and talking about the retrofits to buildings and this sort of thing for safety. Maybe catching up with families who lost loved ones during the event. So the news is actually much more flexible as a resource than people give it credit for. You can use it for primary documents, a snapshot of the time from that time. You can use it for updates. You can use it for current facts. So depending on what you're looking for, that tells you how far back you want to go in your news. Maybe the last week to the last six months for current topics. Maybe the last however long it was until that event was for historical topics. And as always, you start broadly and then you narrow it down. So um, I'm going to use, uh, for example, artificial intelligence and social media as a search um, because I want to see about the impact on that. That's a very current topic that is developing a lot, but there are also a lot of social and psychological studies that have been done about social media. So it's a little bit of um, older resources and newer resources and news. So if I go for this search, I might go to OneSearch or I might go to a specific database to take a look and see what I find. And the way that you do that is you click on that databases button on the library homepage that I showed you and you have some choices here. You can choose by subject. This is broad subject, art, business, literature, communication, etc. You can search by database type. I'm looking just for scholarly journals, although there might be some book chapters in there. I'm searching just for news, although there might be some videos in there. I tend not to look by vendor or provider. Sometimes your instructor will say, use EBSCO. EBSCO is a vendor, so you could say, okay, I'll go and look at the EBSCO databases. Not probably the most effective way to search. And then um, I want to give you a bit of a heads up or a warning when you search for databases. This searches only the description of the database. It does not search within the database. So for example, if I were doing a paper for art history and I wanted to write about Andy Warhol, if I clicked Andy Warhol in here, I would find zero. And I know we have stuff on him. If I searched for pop art or for art here, in the description of the database, if it includes the word art, it would be found. So I would find 14 databases. And then I would go within those databases and search for Andy Warhol and find lots of articles. So be very careful when using this. I tend to go by subject when I go searching. Some good options for general searching include JSTOR, which are all scholarly journals. U.S. Major Dailies. Why do I like, like this database? Because if I use U.S. Major Dailies, I don't have to go to the New York Times website and the LA Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post websites all individually and then go through their hoops and their paywalls to try to find my stuff. Instead, I can go to U.S. Major Dailies. It has all of these plus others. It does a search from 20 years ago to today, full text, without me having to pay for anything. And it's all there in one search result that I can then refine and sort out however I need it. And it gives me help with citation. So that's why I go to the database instead of the web for newspapers. Things like Academic Search, which is a general database, a little bit of everything on a little bit of every topic. And Opposing Viewpoints, which is a good place to go if you're unsure about your topic. It has lists of topics and starting places for those topics. So we're going to do a database search, and I'm going to look for information on social media and election information, which is very specific. So when I go searching for that, I head back into the library. And from there, I, I could do it at one search, but I'm going to go into databases. And I'm going to say, well, what subjects could social media and election information be under? Might be under communication might be under current affairs and social issues, um, might be under maybe political science or even psychology. Because this topic goes over into multiple disciplines, subjects might not work for me. It might cut away too much. So instead I'm going to go for something a little more general. One easy way to start with that is to go into our featured databases. These are the ones that are used a lot. You'll notice US Newsstream is listed there. So um, 
I might head just right into Academic One File and see what I see. When I do that, and I say social media, notice it gives me options. Do you want digital marketing? Marketing? No, I want political information. And when I search that, it breaks it down in this specific interface into journal articles, magazines, books, news, videos. Make sure it gives me the full text of it. I can change it over here for various filters. I want subjects, I want publications, I want peer reviewed. We actually have a video on how to use Gale Academic OneFile on our SMC Library YouTube channel. So to go deeper into that, I would recommend taking a look at that database. So just to check and see what one of them looks, at, looks like. Individual differences in sharing false political information on social media. That might be kind of interesting. I click on that, and this is in PLOS One, which is a medical journal. It tells me how long it is, gives me information about it, gives me the actual article itself. Goes on a while because it's a scholarly journal article and they're always long. Gives me some other options, including an overview that might tell me a little bit more about it. Okay, Gives me related subjects. And with this article, I can save it to my drive or the cloud. I can email it to myself, download it, or print it. So if you'd like more in-depth information on how to use this database, please check us out at the SMC Library YouTube channel. But if you want to find more results on this topic, you can just, <coughs> you can just head back to your results and find more information. Once you've exhausted this database, you head into a different database and try your search because the different databases cover different topics. And they might also even include different publications. So you might find journals in here that weren't in the other database and get a broader perspective. Now it has full text, so we're good to go. When I search that out, notice this interface is very different, but you can still limit by date, you can limit by academic, you can give it subjects, that sort of thing. And there is also a video on how to use this database in more depth on our YouTube channel. So that's how you find your articles. Heading back into our presentation. The last bit I want to cover is evaluation. And this is evaluation of individual resources as opposed to determining whether those resources you found will be appropriate for your research need in your essay. So I love this because obviously this quote did not come from Abraham Lincoln. We didn't have computers, much less the internet in the 1850s and 60s. <laughs> but it looks legit. So you have to be a bit careful about that. And you have to evaluate based on a number of things. And there are as many evaluation schemes out there as there are grains of sand in beaches. So generally, I try to get away from the page itself. The page itself will tell me what it thinks I want to hear in order to believe it. So it may not include facts. It may um, shine some things up and cover some other things up. So instead, I want to read laterally. And this is the way that professional fact checkers work. First, they try to find out who is responsible for the information in that article or that site. And they go out to other websites to see what they say about that author, to see what they say about their stance or their bias or their opinion. Okay. Then you take a look at the reliability of that article. Is it new? Has it been updated? What do fact-checking sites say about it? Um, and in that website evaluation um, video that we have on our YouTube channel, we have a list of different fact-checking um, sites that you can go take a look and, and see. Uh, there's also Ground News, which I highly recommend, um, where you can take a look and, and see if that is listed um, and what it has to say about it, where it falls in the political spectrum, where it falls in the reliability spectrum, the fact-checking that's been done. And then the T in art is who is this website or article targeted toward and why are they targeting that group? Um, so are they trying to get you to make a purchase, to buy a service, to believe an opinion, to vote a specific way, etc.? So um, 
and I love this, uh, lateral readers don't spend time on the pager site until they've first gotten their bearings by looking at what other sites and resources say about the source at which they're looking. So you get a feeling for the reliability of that site before you ever find out what is in that site. Because if you dive just into the site and just read that one page, you can be sucked in by uh, elegant, complex, manipulative language. And um, if you do a little fact checking before you start reading that website, you have a little voice of logic in the back of your mind going, mm, that sounds a little off. So it's a good thing to keep in mind. If you are coming to this workshop um, as extra credit for a class, your teacher may ask for an extra credit code. For this workshop, that is Turing, after Alan Turing, who is often considered the father of AI due to his early work in computing um, and uh, testing of human sentience called the Turing test. Fascinating man. Tragic ending. If you need help at any time during your research, you can chat with us. You can come in and talk to us on the reference desk. You can call us, but I recommend chatting over calling. Um, and you can take a look at the workshops and videos that we have um, on our YouTube channel linked through our homepage. Um, ask us if you get stuck and ask us early and often. We are here to help you succeed when you do your research. Good luck with your research. Take care.